when you hear that one of the leaders of the Pharisees has invited Jesus to dinner, your ears should perk up because this is going to be good. When you hear that a Pharisee has invited Jesus to a dinner party on the Sabbath, you know it's going to be really good. It also makes you wonder, why do they keep inviting Jesus to dinner? Because he always seems to leave everybody uncomfortable, wondering, why did we invite him in the first place? You also wonder why Jesus hasn't figured out that they really want him to be politely behaved, but just enough entertainment to, uh, uh, to get people talking just for a little bit about the dinner party. But I will tell you, at very least, uh, when you invite Jesus to a dinner party, it's going to be talked about for over 2,000 years. <laughs> In a related note, the sign-up sheet for our brunch, lunch, and dinner is up right now, and you can sign up, and who knows how long they'll talk about your dinner group. Um, but Jesus always seems to point out what is right in front of everybody. He always seems to use these moments where uh, they invite him so that he might be the entertainment because he's somebody that the community is talking about, uh, not just to entertain uh, and, and, and meet the expectations of the group, uh, but to teach and to point. Uh, and he certainly does so today. And he's watching. He's watching how everybody comes in, and he's probably uh, watching with pangs of, 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 of hurt, watching each one in their anxieties, trying to figure out where they measure up. Well, well, where should I sit? Am I the fourth most distinguished person? If I sit here, will I be asked to move? Uh, but I don't want to sit too far back, because that, uh, that assumes that I'm not as important. But, uh, but boy, wouldn't it be embarrassing to sit uh, at the front and then get moved down? And you, he sees them all. Uh, and they're not just uh, gathering at the table like we do at the Eucharist, shoulder to shoulder, uh, in, 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 in harmony with one another. They are evaluating themselves up and against them. Like up and against one another, and not with the yardsticks that God has for us, uh, but uh, who's most distinguished, who's uh, uh, deserving of that seat at the right hand. Uh, and Jesus calls them out. Jesus says, stop it. Stop measuring yourself against one another. Stop measuring yourself against all of these false yardsticks. And this was an opportunity also for the, the person hosting the dinner. You know, uh, you can butter up a, a potential future father-in-law by giving him the distinguished position. Uh, and uh, with such a shame culture, where you sat uh, was incredibly important. So you also could point out somebody who maybe cheated you in business uh, uh, and actually move them down just to bring shame upon them and their family. And, and the amount of shame that would be brought uh, for that uh, is, is, is pretty considerable. It's hard for us to really live into that metaphor uh, because sitting at a table, you know, you get the same food at one end or the other, and the conversation's usually equally as good. Uh, but picture a different culture uh, where there's a tremendous amount of uh, prestige and shame on the line by where you sit. And Jesus points to him and says, that's not what this is about. When we gather at the Lord's table, when I break bread with my friends, it's to honor each of them, it's to let them all know that they are beloved, that they are worthy of, of breaking bread together, that they are children of God, not so that we can measure each other against each other with false uh, yardsticks, uh, but so that we can actually break bread and be in communion with one another. That's what the kingdom of God looks like. That's what that heavenly banquet that we have a foretaste of every Sunday is meant to be like. That's what we're meant to be building so filled with our own stuff. And you know what? I think it's less arrogance than insecurity. I think more of our sin uh, comes from insecurity than from arrogance. But it's being so filled with our own stuff, our, 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 our knowledge, our assurance that we're right, uh, our, our ego, our insecurities, uh, you know, uh, all of that stuff that we fail to, to honor and see fully the people gather around us and to celebrate. This professor uh, who was on sabbatical, he was one of the brightest professors at his college and uh, was lauded for his intelligence, but he always seemed to feel like uh, there was more to be learned, and he wanted, uh, he wanted the answers to all of life's questions. And so he spent his sabbatical going on a pilgrimage uh, in pursuit of knowledge. And so uh, he gets to this place, and he hears that there's this hermit up on the mountainside uh, that seems to hold, a very holy man, who seems to hold all of life's knowledge. And he figures if he can go in uh, and, and poke him enough, uh, he, can get, uh, he can get all the answers that still uh, seem so elusive to him. So he goes up, uh, and the hermit uh, welcomes him in, and he figures, like, this is going pretty well. I've got in. Uh, and the hermit asks him if he wants some tea. He says, of course. And he sits there waiting to get all of this uh, knowledge that he so desperately seeks. 
Uh, and as the tea is, is finished percolating, uh, the hermit starts to pour the tea slowly. And uh, he notices that his teacup is, is getting fuller and fuller. And he notices that uh, he didn't stop uh, an inch from the top, but kept going and going. And he's watching. And as he slowly continues to pour the tea, and all of a sudden the tea is over the top of the teacup, uh, filling into the saucer. And he's still pouring and he's still pouring. And now it's filling over the saucer and onto the ground. And finally, the professor can't stand it any longer. And he says, stop, what are you doing? He says, you're so full. You're so full of your knowledge. You're so full of, of, of all of your own stuff, of all the things that you think give you substance. You are so full that nothing I tell you will go in. It'll just pour out on the floor until you empty yourself. You can't be filled up. You can't be filled up by God. You can't be filled up what others might have to offer. You can't appreciate uh, all of the gifts that are gathered around that table. Which brings me to Hebrews, that beautiful reading. That when we entertain strangers, we, in fact, are, we know we're entertaining a child of God. But we may be entertaining angels. What a beautiful uh, sentiment. And then it goes on, I think, even more so. It doesn't just say that we, we're supposed to do outreach. And I think that's sort of one of the flaws when we do outreach. Uh, we love to stand on the, the top, top and do outreach to those who are hungry, uh, or to those who are in prison, we'll, uh, uh, or, or to those uh, who are less fortunate. Uh, but what Hebrews tells us is no. Empty yourself so that you can actually be behind those prison bars and think, what is it like? What is it like behind those bars? What complex circumstances led that person to where they are? What are they, their needs? Uh, what are their, the, uh, their anxieties? Uh, what are their fears? What, what is it like? What is it like for the hungry? What is the feeling in their belly? Uh, what is the life that led them uh, to this journey of needing the food that, that, that I, can, I, I, I can deliver? How do we get down and, and walk in their shoes? How do we empty ourselves so we can be filled with the acknowledgement uh, that this is a beloved child of God, that this person might have something to teach us? I think that is one of the difficult lessons uh, in life, is how do we step down? I remember uh, one year when I was just out of college, and they asked me to uh, help with the youth group. And one of the things that our church did uh, was, uh, it was called the Nest Program, and we'd have uh, a, a homeless come into our church. It was a rotating uh, place where each church uh, would take a week, uh, and um, uh, the homeless uh, during the day would go and either work. Uh, that was sort of a surprise to a lot of the youth, the homeless worked. Uh, a lot of them had jobs during the day, or they would uh, go and uh, 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 get food from the different services or uh, do a, a myriad of things. Uh, but they had to be at a certain place at a certain time to take the buses to the different churches. Uh, and during that week, uh, the church's responsibility was to feed, uh, was to provide uh, hygiene products, uh, uh, to, uh, to provide uh, sleeping quarters, uh, and, and, and to be present uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with the homeless. And so when our week came, the youth group had dinner one night. Uh, and uh, I, I was amazed. Uh, this youth group was kind of strange. If we were going to laser tag, we'd get like five or six. If we were serving and uh, 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 in, in, in doing some sort of service work, we'd have 20. And I don't think it was because they all had to get their service sheets signed. I think it was just that they realized they wanted to do something meaningful. Uh, but they were still growing into what that meant. So we got there, and they all loved being behind the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the sneeze guard in the, in the, in, in the kitchen. And they were serving food, and they felt great uh, seeing all of the homeless come in and get fed, and, and they all seemed to be complimentary of the food, uh, and, and uh, uh, you could smell all the delicious uh, aromas. Uh, and then after they were done serving, uh, we said, now go get a plate and go sit. And color left their faces. They said, what? Go get a plate and go and sit. And an hour later, you see some of the youth uh, playing chess uh, with some of the, the, the homeless clients, uh, some of them laughing together, uh, sharing cultural references. Uh, and afterwards, as we talked to them, they said, you know what? It was nothing like I expected. The person I talked to was very successful at one point and talked about uh, how their life un unwound. Uh, another person said, I got beaten chess by someone I didn't even know would know all the pieces on a chessboard. They realized the humanity of each of the persons, and they got down and they stepped into their shoes. And I think they'll never be the same again. And they learned a lot because they opened themselves up to that possibility. And that's what Paul's telling us in that letter is don't just uh, feed, don't just serve, don't just write letters. Uh, 
but walk in those shoes because that is your brother and that is your sister. Uh, that is your fellow uh, part of the body of Christ. Uh, and you are called to step outside yourself, to empty yourself enough to be filled by it. And I'll close you with a story that I told uh, our, uh, our school. And I wanted them to hold on to this image throughout the year. Uh, and this is the last Olympic story that I'll tell now that the Olympics have, uh, have come and gone. But actually, the Special Olympics are going on now. Uh, and this is about the Special Olympics. And uh, I have had the privilege uh, when I was a teenager to help uh, the, the training of, of the Special Olympians. Uh, and it really is amazing, the uh, dedication uh, uh, and, and, and the level of commitment these athletes are, are, are making to their craft. Uh, and, uh, and at each level, uh, it takes more and, and more effort uh, and determination. And this was uh, at the Special Olympics. Uh, and there's a story that was told to me where there was a race. And they were all lined up, and they all knew how hard they had worked. So they knew how hard each person uh, in each starting block had worked. And they got down uh, for the start. Uh, the, the gun blew, and they uh, were off uh, as, as, as fast as they could go. They turned, and then on that last corner, this one young man knew he was going to win. He was this close to the finish line. And he saw the person behind him trying as hard as he could to make up the distance and saw in the process uh, that this person stumbled. The person about right to cross over the finish line froze and looked back and looked forward. All his ambition on this side, the realization that that same ambition, that same dream lived in the person stumbling on next to him, he stopped. And he stepped back and he picked up that young man and then the person in third place, all of a sudden, this opportunity fell into his lap. He was going to win. But he saw the same thing. So he grabbed the other one. And so did the next person, and the next person, and the next person. So arm in arm, each runner, each athlete, knowing what the other has been through, knowing the other's dreams and the other's ambitions and the other's story, crossed over the finish line together. That's the kind of banquet Jesus wants us to be building. That's the kind of table Jesus wants us to set, where we empty ourselves enough to know the story of our fellow brothers and sisters so that we truly gather shoulder to shoulder, open to be re received and to receive.